Hello everybody, thank you for uh, tuning in to this training video. This is Sean Halsman, Paramedic and Education Guy, and uh, today we're going to be going over the basic introduction to the new Hamilton vents, which we'll be uh, putting out in the field very shortly. Uh, this is going to be replacing the uh, Revell vents that we are currently using, and uh, we're doing a training on this because there are some features on this vent that obviously are a little bit different from Revell. Overall, it's a, it's a better product and has uh, some more capabilities than we had with the Revell vents, uh, but it's going to take a little bit of a learning curve to understand the hookup, the setup, and how to choose modes and do what's best for the patients, including uh, being able to match what the settings are in the hospital when you get to your patients. Uh, so the first part of this video is going to be uh, just me showing you guys the hookups and how to put the vent together. All right, so before we even turn the vent on here, we're going to uh, do a couple things, make sure we have our equipment in place here. First of all, what you're going to see is a set of uh, oxygen tubing. This is the same oxygen tubing that we would have with the, any other vent or uh, even like a old, the old CPAP units. Uh, this connects to the 50 liter port on the D cylinder and also can uh, connect to an adapter to plug into the onboard ambulance oxygen when you're running the vent here. So this is a previously or already attached, pre-attached when you get the vent set up here and we'll be using this to set our FiO2. You'll have a couple of things in the bag as far as the patient circuit and you'll note the patient circuit looks a little bit different than the patient circuits that we had on the previous vents. Um, it looks different but the uh, hookup is actually a lot easier on this one. So uh, when you get all the things out of the package here there will be a little red protector on top of of the tubing when you first bring out of the package, but that just gets removed. It's to keep dust and debris from getting in there during uh, shipping and transportation. Uh, and you'll also have an expiratory valve that comes with this system. So uh, to hook up, we're gonna look at the side of the vent here. You're gonna take your uh, expiratory valve connector here. You're gonna plug this in with the valve facing down, and then you'll rotate the entire thing clockwise until it locks into place. So that goes on there. Next thing you're gonna see is a uh, dual port on the tubing for the patient circuit. The best way I can tell you to remember this is that this makes an arrow and the arrow is gonna to point towards the front of the vent when you hook this up. So we're gonna put one part in here and one part in here. We're hooking these two tubes into the vent from that point. And then there are, similar to the Revell vent, a double set of tubing here, a blue tube and a white tube. Uh, and these are super easy to connect because there is a blue port and a white port on the vent itself. So uh, when you're putting these in, you're going to just connect the blue to the blue and you will connect the uh, clear to the white there. Uh, you will notice a third little nub sticking out here. Uh, this is going to be what we would use for the administration of nebulizer medication if we do go to that point at some point in the future, but for now we're going to leave that open because we won't be doing that in this video. Uh, so at this point the connections are pretty much set to go for your patient and the next thing we will do is to turn the ventilator on and go through the setup and ensuring the connections are correct. When you first turn on the monitor, it's gonna go through a setup cycle as most computers do. Uh, of note, on this end of the monitor, there is a air intake. So you'll see a piece of sponge here, and this is actually where the air is drawn in from atmospheric air in order to produce the pressure to run the vent. So when you put this on the ambulance or you have this with your patient, you wanna make sure this is unencumbered, not blocked by anything because you'll actually be blocking the intake of the air uh, going into the ventilator here. Once the self-test goes through, you're going to have a, a pretty big screen here, and it looks daunting, but it's really not. Uh, we're going to go through the pre-op check on this right now, and then we will talk about uh, what all those things do here. So when you go to pre-op check, we're looking at this button right here. Pre-op check, you're going to click on that. It's going to give you three different pre-op checks to do. Right out of the door here, do not do the O2 cell check. That is something that is routine maintenance that will be done by the people who produce the vent on, on a regular basis, but it won't be something we're doing in the field. So the only two ch checks we're gonna do here are tightness and flow sensor. This gets a little bit uh, complicated, not terrible, but uh, you'll have a couple of ends to look at here as we go through. So the first thing we'll do is we're gonna check the tightness on this. I click on tightness, it says disconnect patient, and it means that you don't do anything with this right now. Tighten patient system, tells me to put my thumb over that and seals it, and this is checking for leaks right now. 
So it's going to do a maneuver in progress. You'll hear some uh, hissing of air. It's checking for leaks in the system. When it says connect patients, I'm going to take my thumb off of that valve there, allow it to finish the cycle. I have a green check mark, which means that my tightness is fine. All aspects of the patient circuit are connected properly and there's no leaks. The next one uh, is just called the flow sensor check, and this is actually just determining whether the flow sensor that gives the information back to the ventilator is working properly. And this is going to require you to flip some things around here. So what you'll see is there's a piece of uh, extra tubing connected on here. This has nothing to do with the actual operation of the vent, but it will have something to do with this, this test. So we'll go back into the pre-op mode there. For flow sensor, same thing, disconnect patient, I'm going to leave this open. Now it's going to say turn the flow sensor. I'm going to take this white part, put it on there, and I'm just going to reverse this sensor so it goes in the other way. And it's making sure that it's going to be able to get both inspiratory and expiratory sensing on the patient as it's working. You'll see it says maneuver in progress. Uh, and then once this is done, it's going to have me flip that back over again. I'm not sure if you can hear it on the video, but there is a crescendo of air movement through here as you go uh, towards the end of this test. Turn the flow sensor. We're going to pull this apart and reinsert the blue into the actual tubing. Uh, and that should be the end of that particular test. Once we're done, this little white piece can be discarded. Green check mark indicates to us that we are good to go. So uh, at this point, we have done all of the pre-operation checks and uh, the monitor is good to go and we'll be able to hook this to our patient as soon as we're ready. Uh, this can actually sit in a ready state for quite some time. So we can have the monitor at, sitting at a station if we wanted to with this hooked up. I, I think they say uh, for several days and, and keep this covered up with a plastic tubing. Uh, we'll probably do it on every call as we get to the call or uh, before we leave the hospital. When we are setting up the vent for use for our patients, uh, and I have to uh, thank Scott Leonard, paramedic and respiratory therapist, uh, came through and worked with us on this a little bit and talked to us a bit about the, uh, the vent and, and what to uh, set this on. There's a lot of modes on this vent, some of which were not available on the Revell vent when we had them. Uh, for the most part, most patients we're going to take who are intubated on a ventilator are going to be in this SIMV mode, SIMV+. Plus. So you'll click on SIMV+, uh, and when you uh, choose that one, you're going to be able to go and set the patient's height. So this is going to go off an ideal body weight, so we'll set the patient's height. This one's 69 inches. We're going to leave it at that for now. Any setting you change on this monitor is just going to require you to touch that number, and then you can use this knob here to select and change the number there. And when you're done, you can either push the knob here or re-click the screen. So we'll click on that, uh, and then we're good to go. I've selected SIMV+, I can now go into my controls, and this is where I'm gonna match the settings at the hospital, all right? So let's say our patient uh, has a title volume of uh, 450, so we're gonna click on title volume, we'll drop this to 450, click again. Uh, let's say he's got a breath rate of 14 per minute, so we'll click on there, we'll set that for 14, turn that off, uh, if he's got an FiO2 that we're going to run, we'll run it at, let's say, 60% FiO2. Uh, and let's say the PEEP that they want for this patient is uh, 8, so we'll set for that. So we've got all of our settings mashed in here. There's a pressure support setting. There's a rate setting. Um, these are all just the settings that we're going to match with the hospital the way we did with the Revell vents. Uh, and then once we're good to go with that, uh, we're going to be able to uh, initiate the ventilations. We've gone to SIMV, we've completed all of our presets, and now we're going to start ventilation. As soon as I start ventilation, it's going to run. Uh, so I can click on start ventilation here, and I can plug this into my patient, who is over here, already intubated at the hospital. We're going to connect this. Note on connections, when we do connections for these patients, we're going to put the HEPA filter in silence alarms for a second. The HEPA filter is going to always go closest to the patient, so we're going to pop that on. 
We're going to use our capnography on top of that, and then this will connect to the whole kit and caboodle here. So we can get this to sit nicely for the patient, find a way to hold this up so that it's not uh, pulling on there, and then we're going to allow the patient to start ventilating. You'll see chest rise and fall, uh, and we should be in good shape there. The Warnings that pop up on the screen over here are uh, telling me a couple of things. Oxygen supply failed. The oxygen supply failed because I didn't hook up the oxygen yet. So what we can do for that, go in and hook up our oxygen. Your alarm silence is gonna be right here, which is an important feature for every product to know because uh, you're gonna get alarms on these events uh, even when there aren't significant problems. So. This is a two minute pause on the alarms. If you're looking at the alarms and you wanna see what's actually happening, you're gonna go into here and it's gonna give you a list of things that have gone wrong. Uh, and you can click on one of these uh, individually and work through. A few things to look at. You're gonna see pressure limitation. All of uh, the monitor settings on this particular ventilator are pressure limit settings. So there is gonna be a pressure limit uh, to avoid the patient being over inflated and causing barrel trauma. So the pressure limit you can set on this, but I think it is preset. Low minute volume is going to be basically, uh, based on the calculation of the patient's height, there is a ideal minute volume for the patient. And that minute volume should be achieved throughout the settings on the vent as the patient is just transported. Uh, it is possible, and this is uh, directly from uh, Scott Leonard, it's possible that your patient is gonna do just fine on a setting that has been set for them, uh, but the monitor itself is going to indicate that it is a, a mismatch and that there is a problem with the uh, the ventilatory uh, minute volume as we go through. So there is a way to change the alarm on that, which I'll show you in a second. Okay. On the screen here, you are seeing the uh, up and down nature of the inspiration and expiration. It just gives you, similar to an EKG, the length of time that it's taking for the breath to go in and out. Um, and this is giving you uh, the flow per minute for each breath. And then up on top, we have our pressure. Our peak pressure is at the top of ventilation and, and as we get to the highest uh, level of that. If you're finding that your patient is setting okay, that they have a decent SpO2, their ETCO2 is running in the range that it normally should be run at, but you still are running into this problem with a persistent low uh, minute volume alarm, you can go into settings down here, hit alarms, and you can actually change the alarm thresholds, right? So in this case, you have a persistent um, low tidal volume alarm, we can just change the threshold for that. As long as the patient's uh, saturations are good and the uh, capnography is good, we're gonna drop that uh, down so that uh, it's not saying VT low anymore for you. And that'll be the uh, best way to, to fix this so you're not getting a persistent alarm. And again, it assumes that your patient is oxygenating and setting okay. It changed the pressure, so if we were getting higher pressure alarms, if our, if our patient was having some restrictive airway problems or restrictive lung tissue disease and the pressures were continuously getting up to 40 every other breath, we could actually take that pressure alarm and set that to a slightly higher number, 45, 46, so that we wouldn't be getting that pressure alarm uh, and setting back on there. Now, normally we're going to be uh, not changing any of the settings on the ventilators without med control or discussing this with the doctor or, or uh, respiratory therapist. Uh, but if the alarms are alarming for minor problems, we can change the alarms just to keep them from going off as long as we continue to get uh, the appropriate uh, ventilatory uh, gas from their patient, good CO ETCO2s and good um, oxygen values as we run through that. So right now our patient is uh, pretty well ventilated. We've got the tube in place. He's moving air okay. Um, one of the neat features about this particular vent uh, is that you can actually go into the view that you get and you can change this to uh, a graphic view and you can do a dynamic lung view. Um, this will be covered in a later training, but the shape of the lung and the amount of filling in the lung can tell you a little bit about the actual uh, physiology and pathophysiology of the patient that you've got. So you can see uh, what's happening in the lungs. A square lung means something a little different than a curved lung, and um, the expansion is, is uh, based off of this. So these are some uh, higher level settings that uh, we certainly can talk about and we'll, we'll learn more about as we go through. But the point is to be able to show up at the hospital uh, get the vent set up, check it, hook it up to the patient, and then match the settings for the patient that we're gonna be transporting. Uh, and this would be the setup for an intubated patient. 
so we've silenced this alarm here, high oxygen alarm. Uh, we can go to alarms again and limits, and we can change that as well. So on limits two is your oxygen alarm. We can drop this. We can put this all the way down to uh, low oxygen being down into the 30s and high oxygen being up into the 70s. Uh, and again, this just changed the thresholds for the alarm. So if you have put the patient on the settings that the hospital has indicated and those settings are causing the vent to alarm, uh, we can change the threshold holds for the alarms so that um, we're not running into a problem with the uh, alarms going off the whole time of the way to the hospital because obviously that's annoying for everybody involved. So the next part of this will be setting up the uh, BiPAP unit and we're going to put the mask on this guy and uh, show you how to hook up BiPAP for patients. So welcome back to this next part. Uh, this is going to be a discussion of how to set up the BiPAP system on the Hamiltons. Now the nice thing is that the Hamiltons actually respond to and work much better in the uh, BiPAP mode than the Revell seem to do. Uh, they seem to tolerate the differences uh, much easier. So uh, we're going to assume that we've already done our whole uh, circuit setup here the way we did before. Everything is good. There's no leaks. Uh, and we're ready to go. And now we're going to choose our mode for the patient who needs uh, BiPAP from the hospital. Uh, this is our patient. We'll assume he's on a mask at the hospital. He's going to wait here patiently while we hook this up. If we come over to the monitor, uh, what we're going to see here are the various modes we can click on. And for our BiPAP mode, we're going to choose NIV-ST. We're going to click on that. And then we're going to go over to controls. And we're going to set up for the controls on this. Now, when we get into uh, BiPAP mode, obviously we're requiring the patient to be breathing in order for this to work out. Uh, so there is a expectation that the patient is breathing. You will see a rate. This is a backup rate. This is a rate that, for example, if the patient stopped breathing or went apneic for a short period of time, this would actually deliver breaths at the rate set on this. Hopefully we're going to notice that that patient has gone apneic. Uh, however, uh, if we don't notice immediately, then and that would uh, be the rate that we're going to, to look at. So right now it's set for 12. Um, this is your inspiratory and expiratory uh, pressures. So the, the whole purpose of BiPAP is to have a different pressure on inspiration than on expiration. Um, your expiratory pressure is your PEEP. So whatever they had that set at. In this case, it's set at eight. We're gonna leave it at eight. Let's say your inspiratory pressure was uh, set at 16 at the hospital, right? So we're gonna change our inspiratory pressure, click on that. We're gonna put this to 16. Uh, and again, these are settings that are going to be determined by the status of the patient with consultation from the doctors and respiratory therapists. That's not something we're going to be adjusting ourselves or determining in the field. Once we have these all set, then we can go ahead and set our SpO2, I'm sorry, we can go ahead and set our FiO2. Uh, let's say we want this patient to be on 75%. Uh, we're going to cl click off of that. We're going to put the patient on 75% FiO2. Let's say he's pretty bad and uh, then we'll click off of this and then we're good to go. When we leave this control area, we're now going to be ready to go. We can start ventilation uh, and that's going to try to attempt to attach the patient. Now, we'll plug this into the mask the same way that we would normally do this and it's going to try to establish a seal and get the patient to start uh, breathing. Okay, so once we have the mask in place on the patient, uh, we should be using our mask from our CPAP unit. It's probably the safest way to go about doing this. Uh, you may try to use the mask from the hospital if that's more comfortable for the patient. They should be universally adaptable. Uh, however, we're going to put our system on the patient, match the numbers, and hook them up just like we did with the intubated patient out in the field. Now, in this situation, we have a plastic mannequin who obviously is not initiating any breaths on his own. So what you're seeing right now is that uh, the default rate of 12 breaths per minute is kicking in and he's getting a uh, a predetermined tidal volume based on his being apneic. Um, a patient in the field who is breathing on their own obviously will be generating a pull from this and will be getting the uh, support and pressure support from that um, difference between the inspiratory pressure and, and the PEEP. So that becomes important to uh, match those numbers to the hospital and make sure that the patient is getting the, the assistance that they need. Uh, one of the things to, to be uh, considerate of as we move forward with COVID and some of the clinical presentations we're getting is that we are seeing patients at the hospitals who are on uh, BiPAP 
and uh, are having difficulty with the mask and actually need to be sedated or have some level of sedation there. So one of the things available to us at the hospital, if you've gone for a transfer on a BiPAP and you've correctly attached the ventilator and you're unable to get the patient to tolerate it or is having problems, certainly uh, I would summon the, uh, the physician from the floor or the uh, respiratory therapist who perhaps set up the uh, initial settings and talk them through this with you and, and make sure your settings are good. Uh, and that patient actually may require some sedation. It's a stressful situation. They may be already hypoxic to some degree and uh, have uh, a difficult time with the mask on their face. So something to be uh, concerned with as we go out and do this. But um, other than this minute volume alarm that occasionally pops off, as long as the gases again are good and we have uh, good ETCO2 and good uh, SpO2, we should be okay. And, and you can see already that this uh, system tolerates the BiPAP setting much better than the Revell vents without uh, triggering an alarm every two minutes. Uh, so that's how we'll move through that. Uh, this is the basic setup for uh, BiPAP and for our intubated patients. If the patients need something different from what we've just seen here, this is probably going to be the realm of the respiratory therapists on scene and the doctors to discuss with them what needs to change and what settings we can do to uh, best uh, set this up for our patients as, as we go out in the field there. Uh, a couple more things before we end this. Uh, there is a control module on the side of the board here. There's a few buttons involved in this one. Uh, this is going to take a screenshot of your current settings. Uh, not something we're going to use in the field too often unless you actually want a screenshot of that, but you can click on that and it'll produce that. You need a USB drive to get the screenshots for those. The button here with the lungs on it, this is actually a manually triggered breath. So when you hit that, that will be the manually triggered breath button that you could give to a patient if you wanted to uh, do a test on that. Uh, over here is the light dark button. So you'll see on the screen, if I push this, it's just going to decrease the luminosity on the screen so that patients, uh, if you're in low light or high light conditions, you can shut that down higher or lower if you want to. Uh, and then the one with the lock is obviously a lock screen. So once you've locked the screen out, you can't change anything by touching the screen itself. So you won't bump into something or uh, have a setting get shifted on you when the screen is locked. Again, make sure that you are unlocking it before you want to do touch screen. As far as shutdown on the vent, when we've gotten to the hospital, we've transferred the patient over and we are uh, getting ready to leave. The first thing you want to do is hit the power button. The power button is going to bring up the standby menu and it's going to ask you to activate standby, which you're going to click and do. Once you're in standby mode, you can change modes, you can do different uh, setting changes on the monitor, but at this point, if you hold the power button, that will turn the ventilator off. So the ventilator cannot be accidentally shut off with one push of the power button. You have to first put it into standby mode and then turn it into uh, the off mode by holding the button down there. One of the things we did not talk about earlier, but it's probably good to know on the front of the vent here, uh, there are batteries. The batteries are going to be charging all the time. They plug into the wall at whatever location they're being stored at in, in the unit. Uh, the battery on this side is a semi-permanent battery. It's actually screwed into the... Uh, machine and it will not come out unless you unscrew it with a screwdriver. So there's always a permanent battery in here. We have a set of additional batteries that would be removable that would go in and out of this uh, slot right here. And I believe each battery has a four hour charge on it. So with two batteries in there full charging, you'll have a full eight hours on that. And then if you wanted to bring an additional battery for a long distance type transfer, you'd be able to pop this battery out and replace this one. This one stays in uh, and is uh, permanent semi-permanent in the machine. If this one ever fails or starts to uh, develop a situation where it won't charge, this will have to be removed with a screwdriver and we have to place a new battery in there. So that is the, uh, the battery change for this. And the machine itself also comes with a uh, built-in electrical cord that will plug into an inverter or a standard uh, AC plug so we can work with that if we're out in the field and we're going for a long distance there. Uh, this video will be the bulk of the training for the quiz that's online that will do 3SO and uh, certainly if you have questions about this please contact me we can go through it and uh, like I said Scott Leonard has been a tremendous help in helping us set this up because uh, a lot of the features on this event are a little bit outside the scope of, of what we would normally know for a, a standard paramedic uh, curriculum, what we would do in the field normally. So uh, if I can't get the answers for you, I can, uh, for myself, I can find them certainly to, to go through that. There will also be a portion of this training that's going to be hands-on or we're actually going to uh, have all the medics be able to come in and put their hands on the vent, set it up in the different modes, change settings, so you're a little more comfortable before we actually deploy this in the field and ask you to use it on patients. So yes, there will be a little bit of a learning curve 
with this, but ultimately this is a good vent. Uh, incidentally, this is the ventilator that uh, I believe the Graf Hospital has purchased for their patients, so it'll be a, a very easy switch over if you go to that facility to take a vent transfer out there. And it sounds like um, the uh, Hamilton company is trying to make some good headway into the area. So perhaps down the road, all of the hospitals will be using this type of ventilator and uh, that'll make our transitions very easier very easy at the hospital so uh, thank you for watching this video please check out the quiz associated with the training at the end of this video and uh, again if you have any questions contact me it's s halsman at tcaems.com or you've got my office number uh, i want to make sure everyone's very comfortable with this before we start using it in the field so thanks much for listening and be safe out there this is a quick addendum to the previous video. Uh, BiPAP is fairly new to our EMS repertoire of ventilation modes. It's become more popular as an in-hospital treatment for COVID-19 patients. In most cases, BiPAP is the last non-invasive treatment modality administered before a patient's intubated. So BiPAP patients are likely to be fairly ill when you encounter them. The masks used for BiPAP vary from facility to facility and even from patient to patient. And you may encounter different types of masks, including a full face mask that covers the patient's entire face. As a general rule, we'll default to our CPAP masks as the adjunct for providing BiPAP to a patient during a transfer scenario. However, the connectors for masks are for the most part interchangeable, and if the patient is on a mask from the hospital with which he or she is comfortable, it's okay to utilize that mask for the transfer. If you're unsure about the operation of a specific mask, be sure to have a conversation with the transferring hospital staff. BiPAP, similar to CPAP, can be an intimidating treatment for the patient, and there is a uh, mask sealed to their face with which they are getting some measure of pressure support on inspiration and are breathing against PEEP setting on exhalation. This can be frightening and uncomfortable for some patients. Aside from matching the IPAP and EPAP and FiO2 settings from the hospital, there are a few other settings which you should be familiar with. The first is the flow trigger setting. This setting determines how much negative pressure in the mask is required to initiate the inspiratory support or trigger the vent to give the breath when the patient begins to breathe in. The Hamilton lives at a default setting of 5, which is much higher setting than some of the flow trigger settings on other vents. If you drop the setting too low, it will cause even the slightest movement from your patient to initiate a breath, which may result in them getting a blast of IPAP pressure as they're trying to exhale. This will be uncomfortable and confusing for the patient and may lead to increased anxiety or difficulty tolerating the BiPAP. If you are matching settings from a different ventilator, please know that flow trigger of five is the standard setting for Hamilton's. Inspiratory time is another important setting. This is the time over which the breath is delivered. The default BiPAP setting on the Hamilton is one second, which means that the breath given during the patient inhalation is one second long. If your patient is relaxed and taking slow, steady breaths, this one second blast of air may be uncomfortable as well. If you find the patient is struggling with the rapid delivery of breaths, you can consult with the RT or physician on scene about adjusting that to 1.5 or even two seconds. This will deliver the breath over a longer period and may be more tolerable for the patient. Finally, the backup respiratory rate setting in the NIVST mode is 12. This setting sets a base rate for delivering breath in case your patient becomes apneic. At 12 per minute, we're talking about breath every five seconds. So if your patient is relatively comfortable and is breathing once every six seconds or more, he or she is going to get a breath forced on them before they're ready for one, which, like a flow trigger setting, may cause increased anxiety or difficulty tolerating the BiPAP. Assuming that you'll be monitoring your patient for apnea and knowing that the patient must be conscious to have BiPAP in the first place, it's recommended that you drop the backup rate to six. The Hamilton vent will be set up in the training room for the next few weeks. In addition to completing the questions in this module, each medic will be expected to demonstrate hands-on setup of the vent. Uh, you'll be able to hook up with a supervisor or with myself uh, to get that completed, and we'll have you sign off for that so that uh, we're sure that you've had a chance to put your hands on the equipment. As always, if you have any questions, please contact me at shalsman at tcaems.com, and uh, hopefully we'll make a nice smooth transition into these new ventilators.